session is going to be on um, yellow perch. So we're going to kind of use the same format. We're going to talk about eggs, and then we're going to talk about larval rearing. Um, and I'm going to start us out with um, talking about eggs. And so I think about things from a pharma perspective, most of all. And so we're, I'm going to kind of go through the presentation kind of like a flow chart. So when we're Often we're in production, we start with a fingerling, and then we're producing our market-sized fish, whether it's for food or for sport. And then we ask the question, like, are we going to vertically integrate? Am I going to bring eggs on the farm? Am I going to bring breed stock? And so that first question is, why are you going to do it, and does it make sense? Um, and then once you've decided, yes, this makes sense for our farm, this is going to help us to be economically successful, um, then you're going to say, how, where am I going to get it? And there's a few options for yellow perch eggs, depending on size and what your need is. And then there's always the option of broodstock as well. And if you're going to have a broodstock, you're going to do those indoors or outdoors. Um, and then going on to egg collection, transporting eggs, stocking, and incubation. So it all comes down to money. Um, when I was raising yellow perch, we brought broodstock on because I could buy every fingerling in the U.S. and not fill my production tanks. So when you when you build your farm, um, thinking about what that capacity is going to be and how many fish you're going to need to make money on it um, is a really good consideration. And so, like looking at a few questions. So if these questions you answer no or not always, it's a good reason to think about eggs. So I call my fingerling supplier. And they don't have eggs when I need them. So my tanks are empty. Empty tanks don't make money. Um, I call my finger and supplier to put in an order, and they don't have the volume I need. So it's not cost effective to run a system, uh, especially an indoor intensive system, if you're not stocking at a um, maximum stocking intensity for your system. Um, are the finger rings I'm getting healthy? So there are finger ring providers that are not doing the due diligence to make sure that they have disease-free animals that will come up to your farm and then introduce the disease to your farm. Um, and then um, do they perform well? So depending on breeding and inbreeding, that might affect growth rate for your fish. So am I getting fish and all of a sudden they're not growing? But I'm feeding them the same food and I'm feeding them in the same system. That can be a genetic issue. So if you answer no or not always to one of those questions, that might be a reason to bring eggs on. If you answer yes to these questions, it also might be, um, is purchasing fingerlings in, um, increasing your risk of introducing disease? Um, or is there an economic benefit for starting with eggs? And um, once you've answered no and yes to these and you've decided, yes, I'm going to get eggs, um, it's where am I going to get it from? And that a lot of times is going to depend on the size of your farm. So in our region, we have a lot of farmers that are raising yellow perch outside in earthen ponds um, for the stocking industry. And some of them have extra eggs, and some of them have extra eggs that they're willing to sell to farmers or researchers to be able to hatch and um, fill their rearing units. So you can purchase eggs from other suppliers, uh, other farmers. Um, you can get fish from the wild and uh, Tyler touched on that, so I'm not going to because of the same issues. Um, and with the addition of, I'll add to his, that you also have to think about permitting, licensing, and how you can legally transport those from one state to the other. And with yellow perch, a lot of times there is DHS testing issues or concerns. And, and then broodstock. And if I do broodstock, am I going to do those outdoor or am I going to do them indoors? So broodstock. Um, you don't have to wait quite as long. So a male will be mature at about one and a female at two. Um, they do also, like walleye, require a really cold overwintering season to be able to make good eggs. So a broodstock that's not exposed to long, prolonged exposure to cold temperatures can still produce eggs, but they might not produce really viable eggs. Diet's really important for broodstock. So, Perch are going to take both temperature and photo cues. And so when they're in that optimum grow period, that temperature where they're going to be feeding really actively, that's when you want to make sure that they're getting enough nutrition to be able to 
get the requirements that are going to need for, for producing high quality eggs. So as those fish come down in temperature, they're going to not feed as frequently and feed as much. And so you won't be able to get the nutritional needs for their eggs in at late fall or early winter. So you really need to look at their broodstock feeds, um, whether they're specialty feeds or supplementing with minnows when they're actively feeding. So for natural spawning, they spawn once a year. They spawn in the spring, and that is a, a, that's a light and temperature cue. So if you're at a lower latitude, um, you're going to spawn earlier. If you're like up in northern Minnesota, you're going to spawn later. Um, and each, each female is going to release one egg ribbon or strain. So that's a really long, it can be three to, excuse me, like four to eight feet long in, in length. Um, it is also has a sticky adhesive quality to it, like the walleye. So the idea is in the wild, that female is going to swim over vegetation. The, the eggs are going to get stuck to the vegetation. She's going to swim forward, and the multiple males are going to um, put their milk over it, and that's going to fertilize the eggs. Um, and so when we bring fish inside, we're simulating these same conditions for our inside eggs. It's really common to put a substrate into the edge of ponds, and that is where you can collect the ribbons and give them a place to lay their eggs. So like things like Christmas trees are commonly used in Ohio, um, and that also allows you to transport them very easily into um, an indoor facility. So in addition to those photo and temperature cues, you can also use hormones. Um, the benefit of using hormone injection is that instead of having a two to three week spawning window, you're going to have a one week or less spawning window. Um, so that helps with manpower, but it also helps with kind of synchronizing the incubation of those eggs. And so when you're stocking yellow perch because they're cannibalistic at a young age, you want to keep them relatively close in age range. Um, so once you start spawning, that's a really good idea to kind of watch the physical characteristics of the fish um, as well as the tank conditions. So you can see on the top image, that's a, a female yellow perch that's not quite ripe yet. Um, her abdomen has started to swell a little bit, but she has, doesn't have swelling around her vent region. But when they're ready to go, their bodies are almost kind of box shaped at the end and their vent region is dome shaped and red. Um, they will start to naturally release eggs within the tank. Um, those have kind of mixed fertilization rates. Um, and then the other things to check are, you want to check for male, um, that the male's milk is ready, and that can be checked by um, stripping some of that milk out, but also looking at it under the microscope. The dry culture method is used for yellow perch, so drying the exterior surface of the male and the female. Um, and the eggs to which those are put in. Um, the eggs are put in, you usually use the milk from two to three males, and then you're gonna add water. You have a really short window of time for those eggs to fertilize. It's usually about 15 to 30 seconds. And then you'll have another couple minutes for them to water harden uh, before you're gonna wanna transport them. Like walleye, you can use that night clay to remove that sticky surface, which is really nice for transporting a penny. Because if they're sticky and you put them in a transport vessel, um, they're going to wad up and it's going to be really hard to stretch them out and put them in the tanks. Um, so things to keep in mind that overhandling broodstock um, can lead to injury and death. So you really want to manage them in a way that you're not overhandling them. And this is cold work. So you also want to take into consideration your staff and yourself. Um, broodstock rooms are cold, the water is cold, and your hands are in the water for long periods of time. So you always want to keep the people on your farm um, in mind as well as the fish. That just kind of, this is just showing you the eggs being stripped and how they're in a ribbon instead of individual. The good news about yellow perch eggs are they're really easy to transport. So I put them on a plane, I put them on overnight shipping, and I've driven them in vehicles. 
Um, usually the, the best thing to do is put one egg per bag. And if you're shipping long distance or you're not gonna be there to observe the environmental conditions of temperature and oxygen, if they're using the double bagging method, um, like we see with the transporting of other types of fish. And then once those are received onto the facility, you wanna make sure that those are acclimated. And just temperature is the one thing to keep in mind when they're transported. So you really wanna think about putting them in an insulated container uh, or something that's gonna maintain temperature and make sure that those are um, staying pretty constant. So once we get the eggs inside of our facility, then we can think about stocking. Um, it's pretty common to put yellow perch eggs inside of a tank that you're going to actually do for feeding it. So those are typically flow through or recirculating systems. We see flow through systems most commonly used, but we also have seen things like McDonald jars used successfully. Um, so I think the important considerations for yellow perch eggs is that you want to make sure that they're stretched out nicely and that oxygen can get to all parts of the eggs. So like Michael mentioned with bass, saccharidemia is a huge issue for this. And because the eggs are attached to one another and they're inside of this gelatinous matrix, if you get areas where there are eggs that aren't fertile or you get areas where saccharidemia takes hold, you can walk out of your hatchery one day and everything looks great. You can walk in the next day and every single ribbon and every tank is covered with saccharidemia because it can just happen that quickly. And so you want to think about stretching those out. Um, if you're using some sort of substrate to hold them down, um, eggs sometimes float. So you want to make sure that they are not going to float to the surface. You also want to make sure that you're using devices that aren't constricting, crushing, or, or harming the eggs, um, because that is where you're going to have um, an issue with funguses. And the one thing about stocking, as I'm going to say, is it really does depend on your bio plan. So in the case of the top picture, you'll see that those are the upwelling jars. And so those eggs are going to be hatched, the larvae are going to be collected, and they're going to be transferred. Um, the, the bottom tank, you've got a lot of ribbons in there. That tank could be used for first feeding. So you don't want to put so many ribbons and have such a big um, feed requirement that you're not going to be able to keep that clean and you're going to um, not be able to keep your oxygen high enough once they hatched. So yellow perch eggs, they take about a week to hatch, a little more, a little less. Um, they do well if they're kept between 10 and 12 degrees Celsius. They don't do well if it gets above 15. That can cause some issues. And there, that's an example of kind of the industry standard for using substrate. It's really any sort of material that has holes drilled in it and it's suspended off of the bottom. It can be for, uh, horizontal or kind of be tilted. The one thing that doesn't work well is to stack them. You've got to be able to see eggs, monitor eggs, and remove any dead eggs um, if possible. So the number one issue for yellow perch eggs inside is saprolignia. Saprolignia is one of those things that it's on your farm. You can't kill it, but you can kind of stop it from becoming an issue. And so the best way to, make, to manage that is formalin. Um, not all facilities can use formalin. So formalin is a highly carcinogenic chemical. It has a really low um, period of time, that it, a long period of time that it takes to degrade. And so if you're running a small facility, um, this is something that you can have in your toolbox. If you're running a big facility, the Department of Environmental Management will allow you to have this on your farm. Um, so looking at other options for ways that you can manage saccharidemia infections would also be hydrogen peroxide, um, and that, that works pretty well. It doesn't work quite as well as formalin, but it, it, works, it works pretty good. Um, the other management practices is really making sure there's adequate oxygen, there's good flow, your, um, your eggs aren't being smothered or damaged. And then keep in mind that the things that we can't see are the things that we kind of want to also be protecting our fish down the road from. So for example, um, 
not at this stage, but later on, flavor bacteriums are a big issue for yellow perch. And there have been studies showing that flavor bacterium can be transferred from parents to offspring. And there are things that are transferred in eggs that are not on the external surface. So you think, well, I disinfected my eggs, it'll be okay. Well, it's got to be on the external surface to be able to kill that and remove it. And so just quick takeaways. Um, there are a lot of different options for setting up incubation systems, hatching, culture rearing, and for even getting your eggs. Um, and then just take into mind, take into mind cost, um, disease introduction, because those are big driving factors. And depending on what you bring on, a lot of that's gonna to have to do with economics. So broodstock are extremely expensive to house. Um, they're not only expensive to house, um, but they take up a lot of floor space. So sometimes starting with an egg, especially if you're working your way back from starting with a fingerling, could be a nice stage before starting with broodstock. And the cost of production for that animal at that stage depends on how many larva or fingerlings you produce. So if you have a really good um, hatch and success rate, that might be pennies. If you have a really bad one, that can be dollars. So I ran cost analysis um, for Bell when I was back there, and I had fish that cost over $2 for a one gram fish because we had a year that we just didn't have a really good um, success rate out of the hatchery. And so it really, to bring broodstock on and to make money, you have to be able to produce the volume of fish to be able to cover the cost for the broodstock. So just to keep that in mind. And then like Emma shared, um, the walleye culture manual. Um, I also, this is a research for perch too, because there are some characteristics of perch and walleye that are similar. That's something that I use often, but they also have a yellow perch culture manual. Um, that's really a good base spot. So base knowledge for yellow perch culture um, is available and it's been tested. And the issues that come into perch production other than maybe genetic lines come after the point that we think they didn't hatch the, the egg. So you'll get to hear from that from Peter. <laughs>